Welcome to INP4. Uh, this is the unit on tracheostomies. In this video, we'll just briefly go through a few of the resources on your uh, Moodle shell. First, the PowerPoint, um, and in this case, it's a January 2020 PowerPoint. Let's take a look at a few points from there. So on the outset, I just wanna say that this is definitely something you need to read through by yourself. I won't be covering every slide because a lot of it is just you know, basic reading that you have to do on your own. But I do wanna to touch upon a couple of points within this um, presentation uh, PowerPoint. So if someone needs oxygenation, this is what the oxygen mask looks like that goes on, to, on top of the tracheostomy appliance. It goes right on top of there and that goes behind the neck. Uh, and then this is attached to a rather wide tubing. I think it's attached to moisture later on down the line. Um, that's really something we can go into later or even not in clinical, if you, if you do see it, it's not really, um, the, the thing I just want you to do is recognize that you know, if you're in a room and someone needs oxygen, this is what it looks like. And then the reasons why, um, so obviously if someone has a, like for example, mouth cancer, um, upper throat cancer, then they're gonna need to bypass those areas for breathing, that could be an indication for a tracheostomy. Um, we talked about spinal cord injuries before and we said that, you know, um, some spinal cord injuries uh, and variations for um, people can still breathe on their own, but they have trouble clearing secretions and so they're at risk for pneumonia, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's possible to suction through um, a tracheostomy uh, with um, uh, what's called deep suctioning. It's, it's, it is a skill you're allowed to do if A, your facility allows you to do it, and B, they've trained you to do it. It's not something we train you in in VCC, and it's not something you're just automatically allowed to do. It's, it's per facility. For example, at the time that this video is being made, I know there are LPNs at um, GF Strong who are being trained to do this and then are doing it with well-established tracheostomies. Okay, but it's not an automatic. Anyways, th this is a way to remove secretions. Okay, then the other, uh, obviously a higher up, like a cervical spinal injury, you've got someone who can't even use their diaphragm on their own. They're not breathing on their own. They are set up to a ventilator down in, say, ICU. Um, if it's gonna be long-term, you don't wanna leave that um, the tube in their mouth that's really uncomfortable and painful and dries things out. They're gonna get a trach and then they can, go, they can um, put air directly into, uh, more directly into the lungs and, and, and regulate things that way. Uh, why would this permit oral intake for long-term ventilation? Well, um, later on, you we touch upon a concept called cuffed, uncuffed, and, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that later on, but the bottom line is that when someone has a cuffed uh, tracheostomy, it doesn't allow uh, fluids to, um, or food or anything, to go into the um, trachea, and so they don't aspirate. So if someone's dysphagic at risk for aspiration, um, because of uh, uh, whatever condition and their vent and assuming they have a tracheostomy in situ for maybe one of the reasons above, or maybe this is just a, a, a comfort reason to do it, then it can be inflated, the balloon can be inflated in the tracheostomy, which we'll look at in a minute, and that allows them to, for example, swallow fluids without risk of aspirating. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting one here. So um, when someone is um, on ventilation and they're at being ventilated and the cuff is, is, uh, is inflated, um, it doesn't allow air to pass over the vocal cords. So act, in fact, anyone, whether they're ventilated or not, if they have, uh, uh, so even this person here is eating, say, up in the ward with an with a inflated balloon on their trach, they can't talk because... Um, it won't allow, if, if the trach's inflated, it won't allow air to pass over the vocal cords. They won't be able to vocalize. So um, if someone's on intubation, say down in ICU, then there might, there might be a chance to, to kind of take a break, deflate the balloon and be able to vocalize and talk. Whereas if they didn't have a tracheostomy and they're ventilated through the mouth in the ICU, well, there's no way they can talk like that.
So it's within your scope to care for patients with established tracheostomies. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have an exact timeline for what's established and what's not established, but let me give it to you in the reverse, uh, the corollary explanation. If someone's just had a tracheostomy put in, you know, say during this visit to the hospital, chances are that's not going to be well established. And, and really, I mean, if you want to think about certain criteria around that, um, think of it this way. If they cough and the tracheostomy comes out and there's a risk of that uh, stoma, um, trach stoma closing, then that is not a well-established okay, uh, tracheostomy. That's, that's definitely a new, fresh one. You are not covered to, um, it's not in your scope to care for that patient. Now, take the, the complete opposite. Someone you know, has a long-term tracheostomy, say it's been in for like months, and, and, you know, if they were to cough, that stoma, a trach stoma would not close up. That's well established. That's in your scope to care for. That being said, even in caring for patients within your scope, uh, you're still limited on what you're allowed to do for them. And we'll get into that in a minute. Fenestrated versus non-fenestrated. I don't, I mean, that's true, but it's not, I don't say this is that relevant to you to, to need to know that when you go into a room to work with a patient. It is important for you to know whether it's cuffed or uncuffed, because that's gonna tell you, first of all, uh, whether they're gonna be able to talk to you or not, because if it's cuffed, they're not gonna be able to verbalize. If it's uncuffed, um, they can verbalize. As well, again, that whole dysphagia thing, if it's, if it's uncuffed, you know, are they okay to take stuff by mouth? Or yeah, so I mean, you'd have to check your orders. So that's really good to know ahead of time going into a room. Disposable versus non-disposable inner cannula, that's, not incredibly vital for you to know unless you've been trained how to change the inner cannula. So that is in your scope to change the inner cannula. Yes, it is, but with additional training. That's training you would get after you graduate from the college, after you've been hired, and after your facility has agreed that you, they want you to do this. Then they train you, then you can do it. It's in your scope. Only then. And then it would be useful to know whether it's disposable or non-disposable because as um, you'll see later on in the video, it's just different ways of obviously handling um, the cleansing of disposable versus non-disposable inner cannulas. So in this picture from uh, My Health Alberta, um, you can kind of get a sense of where the vocal cords are. Uh, they're, you know, they're pretty high up there, um, and air has to pass over them in order to um, enable um, vocalization. So just kind of get a sense of where those are, because that will explain what we're talking about with cuffing and uncuffing the trachea, the tracheostomy, sorry. So, um, you know, the vocal cords are somewhere higher up here. And your trach appliance is sitting somewhere down here, so that, and your lungs are obviously much lower down. So, if this is uncuffed, and this is the balloon that surrounds the trach appliance, if that's uncuffed, obviously they can breathe right through there and you know, stimulate the uh, vocal cords through air movement and vocalize. So, on the, on the flip side, if this is um, cuffed, so air is being inflated into here you can see how it kind of presses right up against uh, you know, the trachea, uh, the, the sides of the trachea. No air is gonna pass through. That's to prevent aspiration. Or uh, either that, or it's there so that someone who's getting ventilated, say in the ICU, or CPR even, but, but it, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't inflate these for CPR. Okay, let's put that right out front. I'll talk about that in a minute. They would be inflated because they're getting ventilated, for example, by a ventilator. Um, you don't want to be pushing air in here, and it just kind of, <laughs> just kind of scoots up past you know, the pressure of it all, pushes it up past and out the mouth well, then you're not getting the air down in the lungs. So in ICU, if someone is attached to a ventilator via the tracheostomy, they're going to want to inflate this so that the air just continues right on down there and stays down in the lungs. And then, of course, it's drawn out by the ventilator through there as well. You don't want to lose any efficiency up this way. Another thing about scope, it is not within your scope to ever inflate or deflate the cuff which kind of brings me back to CPR, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, in fact, we can talk about it right now. Um, so it's not in your scope to inflate or deflate the cuff, period. So you got to work with what you got. So let's just take the example of you know, uh, a patient who is um, obviously full code and um, let's just say has the inflated cuff and maybe they're on the ward and their cuff is inflated simply because you know they want to be able to drink but they are at dysphagia risk. They're at risk for aspirating. Um, so they're an aspiration risk really. And then so it's inflated. So again, they won't be able to vocalize during that time. Um, and let's say they have an emergency where they need um, not only compressions, but they need to be ambu-bagged and get those respirate, you know, get those artificial respirations as well. So um, and we'll look at this in a minute, but the, um, the ambu-bag has a special adapter that goes right over top of the trach. I'll show you that in a minute, but just bear with me here. So you put the, you've attached the second nurse's come by and you know following protocol it might be the second nurse it might be the ICU nurse who has to do this but um, you know the second nurse in most places in BC simply attaches the ambu bag and then starts the oxygen cranks it up and then has to wait for RT or the code team to start actual um, artificial respirations and just as, as a side note as it currently stands in a lot of public facilities in BC um, but in other places it might be the second responder to the code does not only does not only attaches the ambu bag, but starts the, you know, one to five um, or, you know, 30 to two, sorry, one to five if it's only artificial respirations. Anyways, my point is <laughs> starts ambu bagging the patient. Anyways, uh, a real big point there, a side point is that you need to check your protocol, your code blue protocol at your facility to find out what the second nurse is supposed to do when they come over, because it's not exactly straightforward as what they teach you in CPR. In CPR, they, they teach you, well, first they teach you compressions is the main deal, which is true. But then they also teach you that, you know, the second responder comes by and can start ambibagging. Um, that's not necessarily true in all facilities. Uh, for example, as this PowerPoint is being made, I know for sure in Providence Healthcare, they want the second nurse to come by um, and by the way, what I'm talking here applies to all patients, not just trach patients. So it's a very big side point, but it's important. Um, the second nurse currently in Providence is to, on the ward is to come by and attach, you know, bring the board for CPR, place it under the patient, attach oxygen, um, the ambu bag, either to the mouth or to the trach, depending on the patient, and then turn up the oxygen and wait, basically. Um, and then the code team or RT will actually start um, applying pressure to the bag to insert um, air into the lungs. And the reason for that is what they found is that when the nurses were doing it, they don't you know, have enough codes to be really, really comfortable with it. They end up putting too much air into the lungs. They cause the patient to vomit and aspirate. It's a worse situation than if they just did a few compressions only and waited for someone else to come by. Anyways, that's a huge side point. The point getting back to this is that if they have a cuffed trach, whoever's doing the ambu bagging, it's attached. And if it's cuffed, well, no problem. At the right time, they squeeze the ambu bag, air goes in, oxygenated air goes in, not a problem. It's, it's um, what do you call it? Um, the bag's inflated, sorry, the, they're cuffed. So you don't have a problem with air coming out and you inflate the lungs quite easily. You don't have to worry about sealing the mouth or nose or anything. It's really easy to do. Okay, now let's take the case that there are many patients with long-term trachs who are uncuffed. And so that means any air you push through here has the risk of coming out of here. You have a choice for an uncuffed patient. If it's viable to do this, you can do your traditional mask over, mask over the nose and the mouth. Apply that uh, seal with your hand and then make sure this is corked. If it's not corked, the air is just going to come right out of here. Make sure that's corked. It means it's a special obturator put in there, corks it right up. And if they, so, if they're, if they're corked, then it's easy. It's CPR business as usual. You put the mask over the mouth and go for it. Now, let's say they're uncuffed, but they're not corked. Okay. Now, all right. Let's just say that's the situation. Then you you still have a choice. You can cover this somehow quickly, like maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're getting sterile gauze, put them over top of the glove and you can give through the mouth, but, or the other way is actually to um, put the appliance, the um, ambi bag right over top of here, give compressions and you have to somehow uh, close the mouth and block the nose from air coming out. So it's kind of a weird situation to be in. The reality is that a lot of people who are uncuffed will have um, 
a quark here anyways, because they either don't need to use this at the current moment or they're trialing a removal of it. And so CPR is business as usual. Anyways, that's a lot, it's a mouthful there, but the point is you need to know whether they're cuffed or uncuffed and you need to plan around that for CPR. Of course, if they're no code, then you don't have to plan anything around CPR. So at the present time that this video is being made, your scope for trait care in terms of entry level competencies. In other words, once you graduate from the college and you go to, um, to, to work, uh, at that point, you should be able to do these things. So this is what we'd be training you in. It's fairly simple tasks um, around trait care. And although it's in your scope to do other things like deep suctioning, like cleaning the inner cannula, it's in your scope, but you need extra training at the facility once you're hired. Um, and they need to give you the, the green light to do that. So outside of that, upon graduation from the college, you're able to do these things. As well as, of course, the assessments and all that and, and intervening for an emergency. So every shift, these things have to be done. And we're going to look at a flow sheet in a minute that kind of covers these things. But this is all. So, uh, you know, entry level competencies means you're going to have to collaborate with the RN to get some of these things done because not all of this you're going to be able to do as soon as you graduate. You need more training. So there's a trait kiosk care video that we'll look at in a minute. Um, and the place to start that video, uh, just so you know, in case for later references, is minute four and 40 seconds. So prior to this timestamp, um, you can walk, feel free to watch the video, of course. It's going to give you kind of um, an overview of how to suction the patient, deep suction. It's going to give you an overview of how to change your cannula. But you don't need to watch that first four minutes because, again, you need to be trained in that before you're allowed to do that anyways. From, minute, from this timestamp onwards, it covers the skills that um, you can do upon graduation. So we're going to watch that video from 440 in just a minute. And so we just look at some of these complications. Um, hemorrhage is hemorrhage. I mean, that's bleeding. They'd probably be aspirating if they're, I mean, I don't know where they're hemorrhaging from, but if it's from the trach site, that, that, if that's what this is indicating, that's pretty serious. They could be aspirating on that blood as well. I mean, it might just, and they might be dropping blood pressure. You know, I don't know what you're seeing because that's a very vague term. But if, it's, if hemorrhage is happening, then it might just be a code situation. A pneumothorax, same thing. You know what pneumothorax is. Um, if it's not a tension pneumothorax and it's just a pneumothorax, then yeah, you need to monitor them, get the doctor involved, get a chest tube. So cutaneous emphysema, we talked about that with chest tubes. Um, so I guess you're palpating around the um, trach site and making sure that no air is being drawn in under the skin. Uh, dislodged tube, I mean, again, you're not caring for patients with fresh stomas, so it's not shouldn't be as big a deal. Uh, typically, you follow protocol, but if you have a dislodged tube on a, on a, a well-established trach, you can you know, collaborate if you need help, but basically you're reinserting a new um, tracheotomy appliance. And a lot of the hospitals and public hospitals will have um, trach, um, you'll have emergency kit by the bedside, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they'll actually have trach carts outside the room with all the equipment in that you need. So you just run out there, you'd grab the extra, or hopefully in your emergency kit, you have the extra trach appliance, and you just insert it. Um, and again, I mean, you probably might want to collaborate around that. And if it's, again, if it's a well-established trach, honestly, this shouldn't be an emergency situation. It's something you want to do quickly, but it's not the same as if it was a fresh trach. Airway obstructions are airway obstructions. You handle that like you handle anything else. Um, could be a code. Uh, infection, again, what more can we say? Uh, look for signs and symptoms of infection, and then you deal with that like you would deal with any other infection. Same thing with aspiration. Tracheal damage, well, I mean, if they're complaining of pain, if there's bleeding, if there's you know abnormal swelling, obviously you're getting a physician involved. So this picture doesn't, doesn't show it, but typically uh, in the ambu bag, bag that you know the bag it's stored and usually has a little adapter that if you have a tracheostomy patient you would pull the face mask off attach the adapter right there and that clicks right over top of the trach tracheotomy appliance no problem 
Decannulation refers to the removal of the trach appliance itself. Okay, so let's just look at that video we referred to in the PowerPoint from minute 440 onwards. Okay, so what she's doing there is, um, this is the part that isn't your scope to do. This is part of cleansing um, the faceplate um, of the, uh, of the tracheo tracheostomy appliance. Um, what you wanna be careful with there, and what she's done is taken some two by two, she's taken some two by two gauze, she's dipped it in saline um, and um, I mean, you guys might be thinking, oh, what about sterile technique? This is not a sterile area right here. This is not sterile. Um, so obviously we're, you know, we wanna try and keep things clean, but what is sterile? Sterile is what's underneath the faceplate, kind of going into that tracheal area. Sterile is what's inside of this um, uh, inner cannula, absolutely. But on the outside here, this is not sterile. Um, uh, sure, we wanna keep it as clean as possible and maintain, you know, um, it, it's not aseptic. This is not aseptic by any means. Um, you're going to be touching this with a yonker suction. I mean, oh, this is okay. So there's two types of suction. There's the deep suction, which um, the beginning of this video shows, which we didn't go through, where they're actually putting the <clears throat> the deep uh, the suction cannula deep down into the um, down to the trachea to the the first bronchi bifurcation, um, quite deep. Um, but then there's yonker suctioning, and yonker suctioning is fairly superficial. For example, sometimes people cough and they get mucus coming out of these, these um, inner cannulas, and there might be some mucus you know, um, built up here. You will take the yonker suction, which is not sterile, and you will suction right around there and get rid of all that. So um, she's basically doing a clean technique here, taking, yes, sterile gauze, sterile saline, but then she's got her hand on it and she's I mean, you could use forceps too, but really, um, this is a clean area. Keep it as clean as possible. Now, the big point I wanna make here though is you need to be really careful if you're gonna do the way she's doing. You need to make sure, some people will use Q-tips for this, which could be pretty laborious if it's really gunky. It might not work, you might have to go to this way. This one looks really clean, but sometimes these get really gunky and the stuff gets really hardened on there and you need to really kind of scrub it. And a Q-tip might not be the deal that you need. But if you're gonna take this route, you need to be careful uh, that you don't over soak this, okay? And this is why Q-tips are preferable because over soaking a two by two gauze, which you guys, I notice, always do with your dressing changes, your, your pledges that you make are soaking wet and they're way too wet when you do your wound care. That's just a side point. But if you start bringing pledges in that are way too wet for trach, you're gonna get a, a potential for aspiration because there's gonna be fluid going around here could drip behind the face plate, could go into the, uh, the stoma opening. Next thing you know, you're getting fluid in the, in, you know, in the lungs. So if you are gonna take a route like this, you need, if you're not gonna use um, sterile Q-tips, you need to make sure this is damp, not soaking wet, no drips of saline coming off it.
All right, so there again, as you can see, she's um, she's put a drainage sponge under, and it's a it's a drain sponge. You never take a non-drain sponge like a four by four square and cut it with you know sterile scissors and then insert that in here. Never do that because you can get uh, fraying little threads coming off of a cut uh, gauze that could be <clears throat> aspirated or cause major irritation. So you have to use pre-cut. Uh, drain sponges um, and they are actually a product and they're pre-cut for you you just simply insert them in there now you may have noticed that she people are again are saying well that's you know it's, it's sterile shouldn't she use forceps it's really hard to do this with forceps look as long as you're touching just the outer parts of this in order to kind of get it in there the only part that really has to be sterile is the part that hugs the stoma so to speak that goes around the appliance and that facing down on the skin keep it as sterile as you can if you touch the outer edges to place this you should be fine All right, so this video, the parts that we covered here, you saw how to cleanse the faceplate. You saw how to cleanse underneath and around the stoma with the sterile Q-tips. So that's cleansing the faceplate and the stoma. You saw how to replace the um, drain gauze. And you saw how to replace the, um, the uh, uh, straps on the, uh, and how, how tight they should be on the tray compliance. And that's about it for your entry-level competency skills around uh, tracheotomies. Um, but you'll obviously need to be doing your assessments and you'll need to be, um, um, you know, ready to act on an emergency. So now we'll just take a quick look at, um, at a flow sheet uh, from one of the facilities. This one happens to be from Providence, but um, uh, so it's one example of how you might be able to work with everything we've talked about uh, in an organized way. So just a reminder that the flip side of the sheet has some interesting notes that some of them might be helpful. Uh, but the main thing we want to look at here is the front side and it just kind of takes you through, um, you know, what you're assessing, what you're confirming as you look at your patient. It gives you a reminder of what skills need to be done and when, like bearing in mind again, scope uh, limitations. And it kind of tells you how often things need to be done as well. It tells you what needs to be in the emergency equipment. And so that's really useful to have a sheet like this.